Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 222 of App Percussion Podcast. My name is Ksenia Kumlenovic, and we are recording this episode on March 8th and releasing on March 26th. Our guest for this episode is the fantastic Ivana Kuljeric Bilic from Croatia. Hi, Ivana, welcome. Hello, 222. Very Symbolic, symbolic. Very, very symbolic, of course. And this date that you're invited on, you know, March 8th, we're celebrating women today. Um, so uh, absolutely, all of it makes a lot of sense. Um, and my co-hosts are with me today, uh, Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. Hey, Ben. And Hi, Casey Cangelosi. Hey, everybody. Hey, I Casey. Just, I wanted to say really quickly that... It was, I, I asked Ksenia if she could have Ivana on because I've admired Ivana's playing for years and you're so lovely. So it's so nice to finally get to actually meet you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Ben, I, I have that. I love this guy, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you guys anymore. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Ben, actually first you asked me to invite, to invite Ivana and I tried and she was too busy. That was, I don't know, two years ago or something. <laughs> She just doesn't like you, Cangelosi. I, maybe. No, 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 no. I don't remember it that way. <laughs> we, we were teaching. I was actually, who was teaching you to eat something? What was it about? You didn't know how to eat properly. What was that? What was that? Was spaghetti or something? Do you remember yeah. this? Oh, in Croatia. Yeah. Oh, when I was a guest. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wow. Good memory. Holy moly. I remember that now. I completely forgot. It was. Um, yeah, you Francesca. Francesca was teaching me God, how to eat spaghetti weird. in a not embarrassing way. As yeah, a I think that's, wow. yeah, yeah, you roll yeah. it. Yeah, you roll it into your spoon and and eat it like that, rather than letting it fall all over your shirt and stuff. Gotta gotta earn that Italian last name. So cute. You were so cute. <laughs> I that. Yeah. that was fun. Okay, sorry. Right. Late bloomer here when right. it comes right, to I just spaghetti. derailed this whole episode, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you did. We all adore you, even now, so please. <laughs> um, Casey, did you have anything to share with us? What happened in history today in music? Yeah, sure. I've got, a, I've got just a, a quick one. So in 1827 today, on release date, March 26, that's Beethoven's death date. So, yeah, today you can say, all right, Beethoven died. That is the day he died in 1827. And there's a lot of interest around his death. People think, oh, basically it's cirrhosis of the liver from his drinking, but that was com com um, combined with uh, lead poisoning. So, yeah, there's a little bit of debate exactly how he died, but it sounds like it's a combination of the two. And we're also not sure what his last words were but uh they're thought to be pity pity too late I don't, hear you. I don't hear you that was the last one i think the poor guy wow <laughs> yeah i think the one i hear the most is applaud my friends the comedy is over it's said to be bit beethoven's last words so i thought that was pretty cool um, yeah. they're all pretty did good. you guys did you guys play beethoven i mean not in the orchestra but like piano and you know, some original pieces for, for, for instruments. Oh, I wish. No, I, I, I was never, I never did piano like I should have, which I'm paying for now. Ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, can you play? <laughs> Release, go. So, so you must have Ivana, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Piano, piano history, history of piano uh, learning, eight years of piano, yeah. Wow. Hey, what's your favorite piano sonata? And I'd take that from, from anyone. Fa favorite symphony, Where? favorite piano sonata. Yeah, I mean, you know what is the thing? That I actually, uh, I just had my daughter practicing. You know, that's why I was late. I was late to you know, picking up your, your call. It's just that uh, I don't know why we get so frustrated, you know, when you, are, when you are learning the piano and you just, you know, remember those days. I mean, I prefer his orchestra works just because of that, you know, because... Yeah, when I remember, you know, when I think about my piano days, now it's fun. Now it's fun that I can play piano. So, but at that, at those times, so I'm all into into symphonies and violin concerto and things like that. You know, so yeah, I won't go into piano repertoire too much, but okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. I played the uh, D minor piano sonata, and I really liked that one uh, when, when I was learning. 
I'll say yes, because you know this better than I do. I'm really bad with numbers. Yeah, probably yeah, 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 yeah. We can Google it I so that, that we don't. Yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, But I agree with Ivana. I really like um, the violin uh, concerto as well. There's yeah. a lot of yeah. a lot of Beethoven abuse surrounding his father forcing him to practice piano. He's he's locked in the cellar for two days after not practicing. He gets his gets beat up by his dad for not practicing. Uh, stuff we're not totally sure of, but they say is probably the case. Yeah. I just uh, I wanted to add that on the topic of Beethoven, have you guys? I'm sure probably uh, Casey at least has. Have you, have you guys watched Mark Applebaum's TED Talk? Sure. And uh, at the beginning, beginning of it, he plays a piece of music, and it's a Beethoven piano sonata. Yeah. And he says, I wrote that. And everyone laughs. He says, no, no, I didn't write that. It's, it's by a composer named Beethoven. And then he says, you know, I played it for, for many years as a little kid growing up. I practiced it all the time. And to me, it's boring. <laughs> and he's like, I know it seems like, like just sacrilege to say Beethoven's boring, but I don't know it is. Like, I played it my whole life the exact same way. And then he goes on to improvise on it. And I have a quote later that I can probably apply to this now. I'll tell you guys that quote later on. But uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. Beethoven was such an innovator. And it's almost like Beethoven has become what Beethoven resented in a sense because we just play it the same so much so often. So anyway, interesting. Yeah. Um, OK, so to rate it back in, um, that was really cool. Uh, history meets philosophy of music. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Ivana, and we'll all pretend like you don't know all of this already. Um, so Ivana Kulirich Bilic is an international marimba virtuosa and percussion artist. She is known for her versatility and regularly appears as a soloist with European orchestras and in many international festivals from Tel Aviv to Bratislava uh, all over the world. Since 2008, she's been the artistic director of ISPF, even a summer percussion festival, formerly known as IBMW, um, even a Bilic Marimba Week, uh, an international percussion event held every year in Samobor, Croatia, which Casey should know because he's been there and that's where he learned how to eat spaghetti. So fun. So fun. Uh, for many years, even has been the solo timpanist of the Symphony Orchestra of the Croatian Radio Television, which is really, really cool. And since 2014, Ivana performs with Nikola Kurbanjevic in Ink Experiment Duo with special focus on stage projects and collaborations with other artists. She also teaches at the Zagreb Academy of Music. <gasps> Can you take a deep, deep breath because you've done so much? And is head of department for conducting percussion and harp. How do you how do you do all of this? How many lifetimes do you have? Have you cloned yourself? How are you, Ivana? <laughs> Yeah, this is this is really something, you know, uh, the, the conductors are giving me uh, headaches now, you know, with this administration job, this is now like really crazy, but it's super interesting. Uh, we are like, uh, 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 you know, our department is pretty strange, let's say, uh, because, you, you know, you have winds, you have strings, you have the piano department, theory department, composition department, and somehow, you know, the leftovers, meaning the conductors, the harp and the percussion, <laughs> go together. But, uh, you know, as much as different we are, um, this, this gives a lot of richness in many ways, collaboration and everything musically, I think, as percussionists, it took us out of a, out of, out of the niche on the academy. You know, you're always we are in the basement doing minding our own business. Um, you know, kind of not being totally understood by other musicians. And this way, somehow, I don't know. We got directly. We got the direct contact to get the orchestra if we need to get you know bigger projects if we want and so on. So it's actually quite interesting. But coming back to your previous question is, um, I don't manage. I don't manage at all. It's just just too crazy. I think I should I, I should better focus on some things, but it's just not in my nature. So I always do too many stuff, and it's just always crazy. It's it's really impressive. I mean, the fact that your career goes. I mean, you're a soloist in front of orchestras. You played in the orchestra, you have serious chamber music projects, you manage a festival and you teach. I mean, it's it's seriously like five lifetimes, I feel, of people that, that would just be happy to have, you know, one of these things. But um, I'd like to know where, where the root of it all is. I'd like to know about your upbringing, musical upbringing. You mentioned that you played piano and I know that your father was a very well loved, respected and loved composer in Croatia. So can you tell us um, a little bit about, or in Yugoslavia, I guess, back then, uh, can yeah. you Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. 
Yeah, so I come from a musical family. My mother was a pianist. My father was a composer and conductor. Uh, so I was very much used to being around uh, concerts, festivals. I was in the opera. I was uh, a lot of contemporary music was going on. I was always around for the festivals, for all the all the events. Um, when I was when I was younger, uh, for a very long period, I was doing kind of a parallel life. Uh, meaning that um, I studied languages, I did French and Spanish uh, language and literature, so I actually studied both things. Um, I didn't graduate the languages, but I came close to the end and I decided not to graduate because I understood that I had to focus on music, that it was, you know, getting... I would close myself in the library, translate for days and so on, and completely neglect the music. So also at one point I stopped playing when I was... 24. I stopped playing for a year and a half because I got offered a job as um, assistant manager of an opera house uh, in Croatia, Rijeka. Yeah. What? So for a year and a half, I did this, like you know, contracting singers, fees, do, do, uh, you know, dealing with unions, orchestra, this, that. That was like the craziest period. Of obviously, I didn't have time to play, and at some point, you know, I was like. No, that that was that was super 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 crazy and super stressful and super responsible you know in many ways dealing with money and everything and i just at some point um when i they offered me there was a moment when they offered me like uh, you know i could become the manager or something like that i was super young uh i said okay now now it's now or never i continue this path or i i go back to music and so i cut this and um, I decided, you know, like that was the moment that I understood what I really wanted to do in my life. So I was already 26 and until that age, I was kind of, you know, doing too many things and not focusing enough. I also did some acting. And when I was younger, oh my God. You know, like, yes, you know, like movies for, for teenagers in, in, in Yugoslavia, you know, and, you know, those uh, those programs on the radio, radio drama, you know, like... Yeah. Yeah, shows on the radio. There was a special school for that, and I did that school. And um, so, too, too many things. I mean, it enriched me, and of obviously staying around my parents, and especially my father, who was composing at home. He would compose, and I would practice at the same time. So it was like a schizophrenic situation. We had a small apartment, like you know, crazy. And I would get there. I would get my marimba and his piano there, and you know, he would start to compose. I would. It felt like. You know, in high school, when we didn't have enough rooms for percussion, so everyone was practicing together, you know, like terrible. So actually, that's that's that was my upbringing, uh, being very much involved with my parents into the musical life that I was actually taking for granted all the time, like meeting very, you know, great musicians and being around them and being at, at great concerts and seeing pieces uh, premiered or created and a lot of contemporary music going on. And also we have this very important contemporary music festival, Zagreb Music Biennale, every two years. Uh, and, uh, you know, all the most important names of contemporary music would, would come. And there was a lot of combination with theater, also rock groups were coming. You know, one of the first rock concerts that I attended, you know, my father took me there. You know, so um, at some point I probably wanted to rebel against music and everything. So I was trying to do something else. And then I came back. Wow. I speak too much. <laughs> no, no, no. This is amazing. I feel like we could just talk about your childhood for an hour. But that's that's so incredible. And I had no idea that you did all of these things. It's so cool. But I wanted to ask you, so how did, how did percussion enter scene? Because you obviously could have done anything, piano, acting, you know, whatever. How did percussion first yeah enter. Yeah, that, yeah that was the moment i wanted to stop with music um after eight years of piano i mean i was really i was you know music was like 24 hours a day in our in our home and one of the things that we would do i was i had to do it too and my uncle had to do it because the 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 the, the brother of my mother so for a period he lived with us so when my father was doing a piece at those times there was no computer engraving so he was doing these huge operas or symphonies or i don't know what big orchestra works and we were copying material so all of us like a small manufacturing studio we were all copying and correcting music so you know they were using me when i was 
stop, but it was a normal, you know, a normal thing. So uh, at some point I was like so much immer immersed in the music and it was all, all around. So I was probably looking for my, you know, individuality or something. And um, so I wanted to stop with music. My mother said, oh, it's such a pity. Just try maybe to change the instrument. No, no. And she... She found a teacher, a guitar teacher, then something, you know, got complicated. And then she said, no, but there is this percussion guy. Why don't you try? I said, OK. And I started with these lessons. OK, OK. And the thing that actually, you know, that got me into this was, first of all, chamber music, like be, uh, playing with other people, you know, and, um, and, you know, orchestra and, you know, hanging around with cool people. And, um, of course, I started then to, under the pretension of having to practice, I started to jump out, uh, stay out of the, the, the normal school because I was busy <laughs> in school. So I was going out of classes there. So I was always not being there because I'm being, you know, like kind of. But I like this freedom, you know. I like this freedom and I like this interaction, uh, you know, musically. And... Um, Somehow there was there was this this moment that uh, you know they bought me a, a vibraphone the Studio Forty Nine with those narrow bars these terrible pedals sorry Studio Forty Nine <laughs> <laughs> you know and um, I got this instrument I remember there was that was a summer uh, and I just you know before every summer I would go there and be in a swimming suit you know the whole summer just not getting out of the sea because my father comes from an island and we have a house there and now this summer I locked myself and was practicing vibraphone like crazy they they thought I was sick <laughs> what was going on <laughs> and from that somehow from there on you know like chamber music uh, getting my own instruments this this you know I felt like I could I could be me, you know. I was not like, you know, my parents in this whole. And this was something, you know, just for myself. Something that they could not control or could not, even if it was music. At the same time, what was fantastic, I think, is that I I got the the possibility very very early because uh, with percussion, you know, there was always orchestras were asking for percussion, uh, operas were asking for people for percussionists, you know. So I was very young. I started to play in the orchestra, in the opera. Uh, I started in the opera house behind the the, the scene, of course, with this or for La Boheme playing the guard, you know, dressed, di, 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 di. or I don't know, the bells there for Tosca, or uh, Reinwald, those uh, anvils, or I don't know, the Eurovision contest, contest for, you know, the rock, pop, things like that, something stupid around playing, or, you know, many things like that. And what was fantastic is that um, I met, you know, some of the most, you know, Le Percus de Strasbourg, at the Biennale, percussion from Strasbourg. You know, we played with them. I mean, I was very young, but they needed an extra, I don't know, 13th percussionist. And I was there, you know, I was, you know, I was playing with Drouet or, you know, with, with those guys. So for me, or Polyrhythmia, you know, the the, the, the Bulgarian, famous Bulgarian group, you know, with Dobry yeah, Paliev. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so these contacts with some real, you know, legendary people, some, you know, great, 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 great guys, great musicians. I think that took me, that, you know, just just pushed me. And yeah, yeah, that was the moment. That's fantastic. That's, wow, such a cool story. And you're so high energy. I love it. Um, ben, you had a question. So, well, first of all, it's interesting to hear you talking about working as a, as a, a music copyist for your father because I, I correct me if I'm wrong but isn't that what what happened with Bach's kids isn't didn't Bach have his kids like doing that sort of work yeah. and then obviously yeah. we got some composers with yeah. J.C. Bach and C.E. You know, Bach. Sorry to interrupt you you know I, I read the biography of Bach and what is fantastic you know he would like like send messages or it would come offer like uh, you know, I can cover the whole concert, my family, yeah. you know, we have all, everyone covered, like, we can come, we can sing, we can, you know, we can play, we have everything covered, they, like, take us, we are great, we copy music, we do everything by ourselves, like, you get the, you know, a product, it was a little bit like that. <laughs> Yeah, Bach had, uh, for the uninitiated, Bach had 20 kids, and maybe he was hiring them because he needed more music copies. <laughs> Entirely possible, although unlikely. 
But uh, Ivana, un unrelated to that, I had a, a question. Uh, you obviously you've had a long running relationship with Marimba One, and that's actually I think the the place where I've gotten to know you're playing most is just seeing you at the Marimba One booth at PASIC. Uh, could you tell us about how that relationship started? And obviously you've developed a signature mount with them as well. What was that process like? Well, um, since I'm wait, I'm not very old. But when I was young, the five-octet marimba was not such a common thing. So, you know, when I studied, uh, when I started to study, you know, we started with some, like, low F or low E marimbas. Like, the five-octet was not, you know, the standard everywhere. And there was a Yamaha marimba uh, on which I played a lot. I had a master, a smaller one, like uh, a, a, a low A. Oh, yes, a low A. Uh, and um, at some point, uh, obviously, you know, I wanted to develop, I wanted to work on my sound, I wanted to work on my, and I felt like I just want to go out there and find the instrument for myself. You know, I, I felt like it's not just, you know, I give you the instrument and that's it, you play. I wanted to work on that, you know, I, I wanted to see how much I can, I can, I can find my own sound, let's say. And, um, uh, in that quest, I came around Marimba One. What I liked very much was this individual approach uh, that I could talk about the instrument, that I could say what I want, that I could kind of influence. You know, I was once in the uh, I was once in the in the in the in the, in the company, and um, I actually spoke with the guys that were tuning the bars, and um, uh, you know, I was like, no, you know, can you? You know, can you add these harmonics or cut those or no more? And then I realized how much, you know, can be done there still and how much we sometimes take our instruments for granted. I liked this approach and that was my, my, uh, 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 that's what attracted me to Marimba One. Um, and there, um, it was in 2002, I think, something like that, when we met, Ron and I. And um, he very soon he they they were starting to think about developing uh, mallet lines, and that was obviously for me. That's that's something that I'm very much interested in. You know, this still working on the instrument, still working on the mallet. Still, I still see there is so much to you know we can we can uh, see or find about our either the tuning, either the sound of, of, of our instruments. And uh, actually, how we started was like, they wanted to go into producing mallets, and they asked me if I was interested in and I said, yeah, you know, great. And um, we were just, they were sending back and forth samples, and I would just like say, okay, I like this one. So like, from this one, let's develop further, or, you know, things, that, that's the way it worked. And then when we found the mallet, like the medium one, there, then from that one, we... We initially that was a bigger series, and then for economical and practical reasons, obviously it had to be a smaller, uh, you know, smaller line. And uh, yeah, I, I was I was very happy with this. Um, I was very happy with this, this side of our relationship. You know, the the um, uh, this passion about development and research. I I think you know it's not maybe just Marimba One. You can you know. Uh, it can be done with other companies too. It's just probably this initial contact with Ron, we somehow clicked and, you know, and the rest. Is the answer your question? Yeah, yeah, very good. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Casey, could you read out our Facebook question maybe for Ivana? Yeah, you bet. So we do have a Facebook question from Chris Nadeau. He has a question about composition and composers, and he wants to know who would you personally consider to be some of the more substantial modern composers for percussion, whether it's strictly for solo or duo chamber, chamber concerto, etc. cetera. Uh, I don't know, Frank Zappa. Um, yeah. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, um, it's funny, you know, we can talk about all percussion or we can talk only about marimba, uh, talking about marimba, um, it's actually, I, I love the instrument, but sometimes I feel like we are uh, kind of stuck 
in a romantic period with this instrument. You know, it's like for many composers with, with whom I speak, uh, the most of the, the, the literature that is being played is like, it's funny for them. It's like, what is this music? And we just love that and for the audience and everything. Um, it's, it's good for, you know, it's like the, the period of the virtuosi. Uh, I mean, I'm also composing pieces for marimba, but it's just like, you know, the romantic period of, 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 of piano where you had all these uh, players who, you know, uh, uh, composed the geometric pieces for the, for the instrument. Um, there are many, many, uh, many beautiful pieces, but also there are many more that are not known, not just for marimba, but also for percussion. Um, it's it's funny. Um, I have a very um, um, how to say uh, a love and hate relationship with the marimba because what I absolutely adore about percussion is that we can play all styles of music. And you know, uh, I'm you know I like to play with electronics and with marimba. It's it's like you know I think it's a baroque instrument. It probably should have been built in baroque. It's like. It's terrible to amplify, it's terrible to record. Um, you know, it's somehow, I'm still struggling stylistically with this instrument. You know, what kind of music is the best to be played on? I'm not, um, I, I love to arrange things and, you know, be, being open to, to all musical styles. So coming back to this question, it's difficult to say because, you know, maybe Beethoven for, for timpani, you know, like things like that. I wouldn't go into saying, okay, this is the substantial composer. We are still, um, you know, there are many, many beautiful pieces, many, many interesting things, but even many more that are not known. You know, in every, every, probably we have our own repertoire that, that is being played at competitions and students play that. But I know that, you, for example, I discover, I go to a country, I know in our country, there are many beautiful pieces that are not played so much around. I know in Serbia too. I know... You know, in in the U.S., probably you know there is a the 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 country is so huge, but we are sometimes I feel like we are in a niche, you know, and we are just like circling around the same repertoire. So this question is a is, is a nice one, but I wouldn't come out with any name. I think uh, I think our problem is more of being somehow um closing ourselves in a niche you know sometimes just like playing for for ourselves at festivals and at competitions and i feel like we you know we have to be more open and we have to work much more on the on the on the you know broader audience and then we will figure out what are the substantial composers you know with the time and with the reception from either broader audience either other musicians Maybe, you know, this is my very subjective thought and uh, these are my, my subjective thoughts. And um, uh, although I think there are, you know, like Casey, you did some fantastic uh, 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 and innov innovative uh, things for, for percussion, which, you know, I absolutely adore. And there are many people like that. But I think at this moment, this is not, this is not important, you know, to be on one. Actually, I think the production of pieces and the, the level of performance is much much higher and it's gone above the the how to say the the distribution of our music meaning the reach of our music i think we're still very close in our little world and we need to reach out more to the to the audience it's so hard yeah it's so i and i, I personally feel like you, you know you, you mentioned we're still spinning and swirling around the same rep yeah i've I, I've used this comparison for this conversation. If you go on imslp.org, which is a website I know we've talked about on this podcast before, but it's a, a huge archive library of music. And I, I'm not just telling you this, Ivana. I know you know this. I'm trying to tell our listeners this. But um, like every piece of, well, every, probably not every, but a lot of public domain stuff is there. And people often say, oh, you know, you there's so many great undiscovered composers and while i think that's true there's probably far more undiscovered bad composers and if you go on imslp.org just pick a letter and start go to the bees speaking of beethoven find some other last name bees that you've never seen never heard of and just pluck through some of what's there a lot of it is just 
garbage. Like, it's just like, it is that swirling rep. It's like, yeah, this is classical, but it's not really very interesting. And I don't know what I would ever write about this if I were to do, try to give a talk on it. It, it misses something really special or it just flat out doesn't sound very good. So there's a whole lot of swirling as you as you've said i think that we just like have to go through and i know i've made it um i know i've made it a point when comparing percussionist composers to what people call you know what well what percussionists call real composers because we seem to self-hate a lot on that and it just seems like no that's a natural process we do need to go through and we do need people like Beethoven who understand the idiosyncrasies of their instrument but can also compose well and can thus teach the world and the rest of us in the future how to write on the instrument and how to make that instrument sound good because frankly like composers just writing for whatever they want and hoping you'll figure it out like I think we're only going to tolerate that for a little longer just my personal opinion. Like, I think having to hold a gong and a chime mallet in one hand while hold, holding two vibe mallets and a triangle beater in the other hand and, like, making that work, eventually we're going to have enough rep and we're just going to go, forget it, I'm not doing that. No, you need to, you, composers, you need to do better. Uh, right now, we'll tolerate that because we're desperate for rep, but I don't think there's a whole lot of that time left. Ooh, angry. Oh, yeah. And so you guys called me negative yeah, Nancy. Yeah, just... <laughs> so speaking of so speaking of me being a negative Nancy, uh, this was actually a Nancy Zeltzman assignment. And I've always thought of Ivana and Nancy as like there was like, well, and of course, Nancy's not with Marimba One anymore. But there was always this like Marimba One club of like cool chicks. And it was Ivana and Nancy and Lynn. And you guys are just awesome. So, but anyway, it was a Nancy assignment. Hey, go discover a composer you've never heard of and arrange or transcribe or uh, make a make make something for marimba out of it so i i did go look at a lot of these no-name composers and yeah man just a lot of garbage yeah but you can you i mean in general there is a lot of gar garbage you know yeah. it's like the, the, uh, nowadays, the production and everything is enormous and in general you have a lot of garbage i mean yeah everything so that should not stop you, my dear Casey, from no, no, no. keep <laughs> <laughs> from keep putting out. I'll keep putting out garbage. It'll be great. But I guess I'm just saying <laughs> the the swirling, the swirling that you're you're referring to. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, what's my point in saying this? I don't know. What is my point in saying this? I guess it's that like, yep, we're gonna be swirling for a while, and it's okay. And every time we say, oh, this is good, and this is crap and let's pass this on, but not this, it's a step forward, like it's a step towards us finally having a catalog and a rep. It's very tricky, like I'm teaching percussion literature right now, and just trying to pick the schedule, like which Lou Harrison piece will we examine, which John Cage will we leave out, will we include both Rhythmicas, will we like, like I, I, I mean, I kind of just pick stuff that people tend to talk about, but it's really hard to say like, yeah, is the Chavez Takata a super historical piece? Like, well, I, I time will still tell, in my personal opinion. I think for now, yes, that is our history, but our history is so short. Like, our history is so short. Like, I, I can't even confidently say, like, yes, that is a historical, that is of historical significance. It's like, eh, is it? I don't know. I mean, it is right now, but I don't know if it will be in 50 years, you know. Yeah, but you know, nowadays it's like, of course, I understand there are several, you know, levels, you know, when do you need to have this rep list, you know, when you're teaching, you know, when I go, when I, when I do a concert, I don't care about it. If I, I'm going to pick a program for my recital, I don't care about the repertoire piece. So it's more like, you know, uh, in a methodical in a way, like pedagogical way, but for that too, uh, it's probably because we are we are a small nation, so there is always the tendency. Okay, we should having you know we should include a Croatian composer, Xenia. You will understand this. You know, we always have this part. You know, you have a recital. It should you know you should have one Croatian on one, one Serbian, you know, or something like that piece on it. So you have to dig into the local repertoire very much, and uh, that's one thing. 
the other thing is that um, uh, uh, you know what I, what I, uh, uh, what uh, what I always look at. Um, I'm just trying. I don't think uh, you know nowadays there is going to be a huge. You know when you play piano and you just don't play Bach and don't play Beethoven. I mean it's a huge miss. You're missing a big thing. I don't think you know when you are preparing a student if he misses something of our percussion repertoire, if he misses a composer, it's not going to be a drama. I mean, it's important to develop musically and yeah, it's important to develop musically and, and technically, but there is still not a point, you know, a composer or a, a woman composer or a man composer that, you know, if we miss that, you know, it's going so, okay, this percussionist is not educated at all. I mean, you have to be informed, but it's still, I think, uh, it's research, as you, Casey, you said, you know, you are trying to figure out, should I do this, should I, I mean, you are the one, you are responsible, you know, you are to blame if they don't succeed, uh -huh. you know, it's like, yeah. uh, you know, when I'm teaching, when I'm teaching, I'm trying to, fa to find um, a composer or a piece that would fit my students and try to develop, you know, his strengths and also to develop this, uh, his other, you know, I'm, I, what I, what I'm looking for is like to have this variety of styles, but, uh, you know, but, with composers, I'm not so, you know, if, if we didn't do any key Kobe, we didn't do any key Kobe. Okay, fine. I mean, you, you should know, I, you know, you should know about her, but you know, I don't know if you, um, if I'm being, you know, you know what I'm talking about, you know? Oh, you sound, sense, yeah. No, you sound like a crazy person. We're yeah. going to have this podcast episode now. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's no, it's great what you're saying, and it it brings up the question. Like, it's very hard to to nail this on the head and 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 really make this point on the nose because we all still debate why we even do this. Some people do it just because they enjoy it. Other people think it really is like feeding and saving the soul of the world. I mean, there's so there and there's so much in between those two things, you know. And it, and it it goes down to that deeper question, like why do art and why why do they do our students have to know about this composer or do they have to know about anything or could they just be free to go make art the way they choose? I mean, it's, it's, if, if we could pin that down, we'd have a plate, a basis for like this discussion, you know? Yeah. The thing is that, um, I don't know, in the real world, you know, when, you know, when you are looking for opportunities, at least there's a, of course, there are di probably different traditions and ways in Europe, in the States and uh, in Far East. And, uh, and you know, like um, when you go into the orchestra uh, world, you are going into the orchestra world and you're, you know, you just have to prepare with your parts. I know, you know, if you are in Germany, you know, there is a certain style and you go there. I mean, I was lucky to be able to uh, get the sense of many musical styles. So, you know. I could play the orchestra, I could play this, I could play that. I had opportunities, which was fantastic when I, you know, with my upbringing. And I think that's the most beautiful thing. I think a huge problem is when you are just, of course, you have to focus in a way, but you know, this this just drilling for, you know, drill for, for just orchestra or just this or just that. Um, I mean, you have to focus, but eventually it becomes just like, you know, Chicken farms, like tick, 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 coming out, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, think that, I think that chicken sound you made, I'm going to copy and repeat for about 20 yeah. seconds. Yeah, enjoy. Yeah, you want, you want more? In the, in the email <laughs> later. He'll it's, sell it as a piece of music soon enough. Don't worry about it. It's going to be, you know, oh, it's going to be. That. <laughs> that, it wouldn't that be cool like all a, a tape piece all based on chunks from stuff people said on the podcast that's ridiculous Ivana you get the honor of choosing what small percussion instrument it's written for egg shaker triangle woodblock whatever <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah 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 no it's so it's so cool what you're saying and thanks for it's thanks so for funny. oh yeah oh yeah if you have a little if you have a little uh if you have a little like fake beard like Ben and I do yeah it's nice you guys yeah. hear that sandpaper? It, I, thanks so much for thanks so much for answering that question I, I, and like sharing some thoughts. I feel like a lot of people it's it's hard to put your finger on, so they 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 just kind of play it cool and say like, oh yeah, whatever, and and kind of blow it off. But it's cool to hear, 
and I don't, I don't mean people on the show necessarily. I'm not talking about other guests, but it's, it's cool. I, I've always liked about you how you will, you are opinionated and you will express your opinion and you have a lot to say. It's always been very cool. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm just, you know, prove me wrong. I mean, I, I really like to talk about this openly. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, great, <laughs> man. Great, great question, Chris Nadeau, for sure. And you know, recently there was a little news article, and Ben has one news article about this uh, this pianist, and I found one or just the week before where um, Yuja Wong, the pianist. I hope I'm saying her name correctly. What is it, Ksenia? It's, uh, I believe it's Yuzhou Wang. Is what I've oh okay discovered in my research. But sorry, go oh, ahead. Good job, good job, good job. But she got criticized for not playing her. She had a recital program somewhere in, in uh, uh, somewhere, and uh, she got criticized the next day for playing her program out of order. Um, like like just that's it you know i mean just simply playing her program out of order no this is a different topic it's the same person but your article is different ben all right go ahead i'm, I'm done okay cool so now that's my turn <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we're gonna talk today a little bit about yuja wang and i, I figured especially with the, with the female guest artist this would be a really really interesting topic to get uh ivana's take on um she's been for quite a few years now uh, a somewhat controversial artist for uh, one main reason we'll talk about it briefly but in case any for the uninitiated who this person is she is a pianist uh, she was born in Beijing her father I discovered is actually a percussionist his name is oh. uh, uh, sorry any Chinese listeners for the pronunciation but Zhang Gyo Wang is her father's name he's an orchestral percussionist it sounds like um, so anyway, she was born in Beijing. She started studying piano at the age of six. At the age of 10, she started studying at the Central Conservatory of Music in Beijing. At the age of 14, she left to study at the Mount Royal Conservatory in Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. And uh, then after that, she went to Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia, which Casey told us uh, after the show last week that she was actually there at the same time as Pius, which is kind of cool. That's what um, he says. That's what he claims. Uh, he says a lot of stuff, though. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, her career breakthrough came in 2007 when she subbed for Martha Argerich in, with the Boston Symphony Orchestra playing, I believe, Tchaikovsky's uh, first piano concerto. Uh, ever since then, she's become a frequent collaborator, especially with Michael Tilson Thomas and San Francisco Symphony. She's toured with them and Michael Tilson Thomas has promoted her work quite a bit. Uh, I found this quote from Joshua Cosman of the San Francisco Chronicle that I think uh, is speaks quite impressively to her artistry. Cosman says, quite simply, the most dazzlingly, dazzlingly, uncannily gifted pianist in the concert world today, and there's nothing left to do but sit back, listen, and marvel at her artistry. Um, but she has generated quite a bit of controversy over the years, in particular for her outfit choices. Uh, one of the earliest quotes on this was in 2011, from Mark Swed of the Los Angeles Times, he said, but it was Yuja Wang's orange dress for which Tuesday night is likely to be remembered. Her dress Tuesday was so short and tight that had there been any less of it, the bull might have been forced to restrict admission to any music lover under 18, not accompanied by an adult. Had her heels been any higher walking to say it, nothing of, uh, of her sensitive pedaling would have been unfeasible. Um, and so then this goes on in 2012, sorry for my reading these quotes, but I think it's important for us to hear. In 2012, the New York Times reported, Ms. Wang's attire has generated lively discussions about what is appropriate for classical artists to wear. The orange mini dress she wore for a performance of Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto No. 3 with the LA Phil at the Hollywood Bowl in August set off debate in newspapers and blogs. Ms. Wang said that she was initially both weirded out and amused by the reaction, noting that she had already worn the same dress without fanfare at Santa Fe, New Mexico, at the Concert Gebouw in Amsterdam, and at the Verbier Festival in Switzerland. Europe loved it, she said, so she hadn't thought it would be a big deal to wear it in Los Angeles. They were paying attention to this rather than the music, she said, which makes sense as LA is kind of superficial and more visual, but they have rules about what classical musicians should be wearing, which I think is stupid. And after this incident, she shared two quotes on Twitter, one from Gustav Mahler and one from Coco Chanel. The two quotes were, tradition, tradition is not tending the, sorry, tradition is tending the flame, it's not worshiping the ashes, and a girl should always be two things, classy and fabulous. 
And she also shared that music criticism should be to musicians what ornithology is to birds, which I think is an amazing quote. <laughs> huh. And then wow. uh, in, in 2017, and there, if you just Google this, you can find tons and tons of quotes about this, but just a couple other highlights. In 2017, Norman Lebrecht of the classical music gossip site called Slips Disc uh, wrote an article that he titled, Now Yuzha Wang Comes Out in Her Undies. And the article is very short. It just says, uh, Anne Majette writes in the Washington Post, the piano soloist was Yuzha Wang, a brilliant artist who is fond of provo provoking conservative audiences with skimpy concert attire, and who on Thursday looked, uh, sorry, as appeared to have forgotten her dress altogether, and it looked as if she was playing in her underwear. So this brings up to the most recent bit of Yuzha Wang controversial news which was recently she played a piano recital in Vancouver and she wore sunglasses on stage. And there was a conductor named Tanya Miller there that remarked, last night I attended a Vancouver Recital Society concert with Yuja Wang performing. I was looking forward to hearing her perform. When she walked out on stage with sunglasses and a direct approach to the piano, Quick bow and immediate performance with no acknowledgement of the audience, I thought it was quirky. With each subsequent work that she performed, she stood up, bowed quickly without a smile, and when she left the stage, she walked with clear body language that shut the audience out. When the audience continued to clap to bring her back on stage, she refused. The effect was shocking. As each subsequent work was performed and this pattern continued, it became clear that she was shutting the door on her audience. And then Norman Leverett of Slip Disc again called her out as attention seeking. So she responded uh, and she said, uh, this is Yuzha Wang speaking. She said, on arrival at Vancouver International Airport on Friday, I was detained for over an hour and subjected to intense questioning, which I found humiliating and deeply upsetting. I was then released, giving me very little time to travel to the Chan Center for the Performing Arts. I was left extremely shaken by this experience. When I was dropped off at the venue for my recital that evening, my eyes were still visibly red and swollen from crying. I was in shock. Although I was traumatized by what happened, I was determined not to cancel the recital, but to go ahead with the performance and to not let the audience down, which included my dear teacher, Gary Grafman. I decided that wearing sunglasses was the only way to prevent my distress from being seen since I hadn't prepared to make a statement about what happened. My main concern in that moment was to give the best performance I possibly could and to not allow the audience to be distracted by my swollen eyes or visibly shaken demeanor. It would never be my intention to snub or disengage with an audience. Everything I do on stage is about connecting with people. My audiences and fans sustain and nourish me as an artist. Tanya Miller, the uh, conductor that had initially reported about this, then apologized and the Vancouver Recital Society issued a statement saying, in, all too often, people forget that musicians, too, are human. We all have good and bad days, and it is a testament to her strength and character that she chose to press on despite the terrible treatment that she received. And they actually posted a concert clip of her performing, which looks outstanding. Um, and then just to sort of sum all of this up, I found a book called At the Piano, Interviews with 21st Century Pianists by uh, Caroline Benser. And it's basically just exactly what it sounds like. It's a little interviews with question, answer, question, answer. And so uh, Benster, in this case, asked Yuzha Wang, have you ever encountered times when you must address an audience's behavior? And Yuzha Wang replied, I just don't care anymore. Um, so I thought that was cool. just a really, really cool uh, approach to it. And obviously, we're talking about several different controversies with the thing Casey mentioned of performing a program out of order, and I would presume announcing the change from the stage yeah. and the outfit choices and then the sunglasses thing, which obviously is sort of different from the, the outfit choices. Um, it reminds me so much of Sheila E., who is known for wearing flashy, maybe we could you know put in air quotes, scandalous clothing. And she just kind of says that, like, yeah, that's that's how I like to dress. I'm a performer. Like, you know, if you don't like it, go to someone else's concert. <laughs> um, so yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts. You brought up, you brought up uh, actually there are many topics and there are many concepts here that we could talk about. You know, you read a lot of quotations. What about Katya Bunyatishvili? Who? 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 Enlighten us. Katya. Bunyatishvili, the pianist, the pianist with yeah. a very abundant décolleté. Oh, I'm not sure what you do. Well, I'm not sure what this means. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain what you're talking about? <laughs> not, not everyone's watching on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> 
you have to say it because if I say it, if Ben or I say it, we get in trouble. <laughs> but y'all are allowed to. <laughs> yeah, no, but talking about you know she because she's famous in another way of uh, being dressed, the way to uh, offer the audience the richness of her décolleté. <laughs> How to say? Show off her you pictures. Have, yeah. <laughs> pianist. I mean, she's a great pianist, but. Obviously, she dresses always in a very, um, how to say, provocative manner and seductive, maybe not the short mini skirts, but, you know, this is another thing. I mean, this is even more provocative, but okay, coming back to the, to the, to, to, how do you say, you, Yuya, Yuya, is it Yuya, 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 Yuya. That, that a few things that we can talk about is, uh, it's the convention. The convention of an concert, of a concert hall, you know, of being on stage, of the beginning of the concert, everyone is clapping. You have a program. You have, you know, this all is the convention. So obviously, you know, you are in in the system, and you have to be aware that anything that you do out of convention is going to because many people come for that convention. They come because they know where they're going. They know what to expect. You know, that's a little bit of a problem of of our concerts. Because there, people go to piano concerts, they know the pieces, they listen to them, they're prepared. They want to feel comfortable, you know, because they know what to expect. They will see a beautifully dressed lady. They are not going to be um, um, challenged to, you know, have their opinion or they will not be com uh, uncomfortable. Because obviously, you know, if there is a, you know, a, a, a provocatively dressed lady, you know, they don't know how to react. So on the other hand, you have you have uh, uh, you have Yusha. You know, if you're a performer, you have to be. You know, you play with this. You know, she's playing with this provocative, and she's a star. And you know, with the star comes the there are two two faces. You know, there is the glory, and there is the you know your your audience that can that can bring you to stars and that can put you down. So. This is not this is not an ordinary human or an ordinary musician that we are talking about, you know. I mean, uh, you know, this is not going to happen to us percussionists because we don't have so many, you know, people in the audience or so many concerts that are hugely paid. So I think this is, I mean, great for her, but you know, with all the opportunities that she has and the money that she earns, I wouldn't, you know, be so sorry. I mean, she should endure. Right. You know, what can I say? I and mean, I'm I maybe I, I sound a little bit cruel, but I don't spe specifically sympathize, you know, with this little drama. Right. I, yeah. And I think to us, I mean, you know, percussionists are, I think, inherently progressive. Like we just have to be. I mean, our, our art is newer. There's less tradition back to this percussion literature topic I mentioned, but also to what Ivana was saying about um, or I guess what we all were saying about like, well, well, like, what is this all for and what should composers be doing and what rep is going to emerge out of this swirling of rep that we're kind of kind of stuck in right now. And it, it seems like there are you mentioned the word convention and like people are expecting certain conventions and it just seems like nobody would care about this if they knew how to listen to music better <laughs> like about either topic like oh she played her program out of order Ugh. oh she she wore the wrong thing i wasn't expecting but it's just back to that idea of like what is art for and what is well, why is it interesting and if i think we just yeah we i guess as educators we have to do better in trying to express why this is cool and why it's just more than entertainment and wh why it matters because yeah i've never thought twice about uh, or at least not thought much about what a performer is wearing you know just don't re really don't care and, and you mentioned convention it seems like some performers they really feel that if they utilize conventions, they kind of get to benefit with the weight of tradition that follows it. So if you do the regular tuxedo and everyone's dressed in the, in the, the way they traditionally are, well, then you rise the performance to the level of all the successful performances in the past that have been done in that way. So people want to harness that and say like, oh yeah, that's really good. I need to, 
I, I need to take advantage of the tradition and use the tradition in a way that benefits the performance and makes it stronger. And then I think there's other performers, which a lot of percussionists fall in, like, no, no, we're going to totally change the concert atmosphere and make it more relaxed and dress however we want and that sort of thing. Sorry, another rant, but. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean it so much. I saw a, a while back, uh, Evelyn Glinney, a, a long time ago, posted something online, and I think I've had actually had trouble finding it recently when I looked, but uh, about how she played at, I think it was the uh, Walt Disney Concert Hall in LA, and she said she went in and she looked up and she saw they had, you know, all sorts of fancy lighting, and I think she said she might have been playing Michael Doherty's UFO or some, you know, some 20th century piece, and uh, she said, oh, well, for the for the second movement, can we have like some like, like dark red lights on stage? And, you know, she wanted not not ridiculous lighting demands, but just some colored lights. And they said, oh, no, sorry, we can't we can't do that for classical uh, concerts. And right. she's well, told like, us that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, you have the lights right there. I mean, like, what's what's the big deal? Like, you know, right. oh, we don't do that. That's you know, it, like, it doesn't fit the convention. And there's actually a great quote from Yuzha Wang that's like in a similar sense. She says, "If the musical, if the music is beautiful and sensual, why not dress to fit?" It's like, yeah, like why, why do we have I mean, to like live what, to this convention? What is, what is beautiful about her that I, it fits her. You know, it's not like she's trying to be something. She is that image of a lady in in the miniskirt for me when I see her. It just, it's a part of her. I, how to for me, it's that's just you know that's just her personality. So for me. I mean, I'm not a man, so this is not distracting me. But you know what I, you know what I mean. I mean, I wouldn't say that you, she's like being, she's provoking me with anything on there. You know, it's just that's her. That's just her. She, you know, it fits. It fits her her persona. Yeah, yeah, that simple. Yeah. Um, it's like you your your persona, you know, Casey. It's just like you know this look that you have. That's. <laughs> I perform in this, this cool, this cool, uh, what is this, uh, jack, lumberjack flannel I have on? Lumberjack style, yeah. Yeah, it's rustic. I want to cool. see, tough, you know? I want to see Casey play in a mini skirt. <laughs> in a mini skirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's really tricky. Like, I have to say, as, as a, as a, as a man getting in these discussions, it's so tricky because women feel so different about this topic. I, I mean, mo I think most artists i bump into say like no you should be able to perform however you want and she's the artist you should be able to uh dress what however way you want but it's it's very tricky because like people ask your opinion and i just feel like yeah whatever i don't really care but if you say that to the wrong person it's like really offensive like what you should care about this she's supporting the objectivity of women and she's she, you, you should really condemn that on your podcast and you have a platform and you need to use that platform it's like dude no i'm sorry i just i just don't it just takes more than that to piss me off i'm sorry i was i was just going to add that uh, another performer a male performer that has come under you could say similar controversy for his outfit choices is the organist cameron carpenter and if you i, I won't go into a rant about that but you can look that up but i mean my whole thing is like you know if you don't like it don't buy the concert ticket but if usual wang was playing in dallas i would be there listening for sure yeah but you know yeah xenia the the serbian the fantastic serbian violin violinist nemanja radulovic nemanja radulovic yeah, you know him, right? amazing. I mean, hey. you know, he has this very unique dressing style but that's him i mean i you know which is totally not conventional but I don't know. It's just like it works. I don't know why. It probably depends on the on the. It probably depends on the place where you play. Maybe it's France, and it you know in France anything goes. Or there are some more <laughs> conventional places. I don't know. You know, but but for me, very much if it goes with your personality, you know. I yeah. Don't know. Well, and you have to feel some some of my students, for instance, or or a friend or colleague, has has a a question about either programming since the, the two topics here are address and programming, I, I always start with like, well, well, how are you gonna go out there and play your best? And of course there's a line if they go out there and say like, well, I'll play my best if I am um, wearing a, a gorilla suit. They say like, well, okay, you can't do that. Well, we gotta we gotta do something more in line with, <laughs> I mean, there is some <laughs> level of expectation that, sorry, we do want to adhere to, but 
I feel like what you play first on your program and what you play second and third and fourth, it has so much to do with like how you're going to feel when you go out there. And one thing they said about her flipping her program in, in one of these articles was instead of starting with Bach, she started with Scriabin. And it was something like, it was like Bach, uh, Beethoven, and Scriabin. And like, I'm sorry, if you can't pick out the Scriabin out of those, like, if that, you, you know, come on, like, well, why can't you? <laughs> anyway, but like it should be about the performer's comfort, you know, and if, if that's what she feels comfortable in and that's what she feels like, man, I look amazing. And sure, I'm dressing really sexy, but that gives me the confidence I need to really, really play well. And I know I feel that way. I feel like if I just feel like I look really good, I can play better. Like if I just feel like, oh, man, the audience is looking at me going like, dude, he looks good, which... <laughs> I mean, I never look very good, but if I can ever feel like that, which is like never, but if I can, when I happen to feel like that, it gives you so much energy. Casey, if I can make a suggestion, get a pair of red pants. Like Ben, <laughs> Ben wears his red pants, you know? It's like, yeah, whatever makes you feel cool, or I don't know, that's important. So so back off, people. Let her dress how she wants, because it's but, part of what she plays. I, I, agree. I agree with you, Casey, saying like, you know, Concert is a total experience, you know, you, it really, everything has to somehow go together, the way I dress, your dress, the way you move, I mean, you cannot cut this off, there cannot be just the music, I mean, this also counts, it doesn't mean that you have to be in a, 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 a I don't know, tuxedo always or something, it doesn't matter, this is this fine, fine, you know, you have to sense what I mean, after all, you know, we have to, we are giving something to the audience. We also shouldn't ignore totally their expectations. I mean, saying like, oh, I'm this fantastic artist. I'll do whatever I want. And you just take it or leave it, you know? So we have to accept some conventions because, you know, otherwise yeah. everything will, would fall apart. And there's this fine balance to see where you can be, you know, personal not to offend the audience because they came to you know to listen to you so there also should be some respect in both ways you know yeah. the, the audience towards the performer and the performer towards the audience yeah and I, I think the quickest way to that is the performer's comfort if they're comfortable the audience seems to be comfortable if they're somehow uneasy about something i mean if 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 she had come out without her sunglasses and her eyes are puffy from crying or whatever, and then she's uncomfortable and she feels awkward and she's not playing as well, people pick up on that, you know. But I, you know, just, just the final the final comment on that. This is a very specific thing because this goes above the usual, you know, performers uh, things. This is the star system, you know. This thing with her, you know, is the whole things in the newspaper. The it's. It's out of our world, let's say. I mean, yeah. I'm not. Yeah. I'm sure that you know there wouldn't be so much uh, newspaper talk, you know, after our concerts if we were okay. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, of course, of course. Ben, ben you had another topic. Oh yeah. So on a, on a totally, totally, completely different topic, uh, Ksenia and I are, are both students of, or if I guess we should say former students, graduates of <laughs> Svet Stoyanov. Uh, and I remember uh, when I, it was 2011 or so, I was playing Alejandro Vignao's Studios de Frontera with Svet, and he went to, I think it was your festival, but somewhere in Europe, I'm not quite sure where, and he played, and I know, Ivana, you played the vibraphone part, and, and Svet said it was like, so Ivana just showed up and just did it, <laughs> like no problem at all. Uh, but could you tell us about your experience working with our, our dear teacher, Svet? Well... Svet and I uh, know each other for a long, for a long time, and the first time that we that we played together, I will remember this dearly, really, because it was a special moment for me. That was at Nancy's festival, I think it was in two thousand and four. Oh, now it's now I, I I want you know it's better not to go there. So okay, it was ZMF and. Um, I was playing the, my father's marimba concerto in the chamber version. So it's a marimba to percussionist and piano. And Nancy was saying, okay, uh, um, I will, you know, uh, two percussions were supposed to be on the spot and I was supposed to come with my mom, but later on she, there, she had a problem, so I had a pianist there too. And she said, okay, um, Richardson, Dane Richardson was one of the, of the percussionists. And I said, there is, 
this great young percussionist, Svet Stojanov, you know, he's going to play the vibraphone. And uh, yeah, and I came there directly from the play, you know, and we got the rehearsal. And, you know, for me, it was fantastic because Svet was so much, you know, uh, playing, he was playing with so much passion, with so much, you know, this Slavic <laughs> energy. And we clicked immediately. Yeah, you know, that was the thing, you know, we really, we really felt each other. And yeah, uh, after that, of course, we met uh, on several occasions and, and played together. But I think this first, this first uh, um, uh, experience was really, really special because uh, very often, uh, um, I, this will be terrible what I say, but, you know, he didn't play like a percussionist. He played like a real musician. I'm not trying to offend the other percussionists, but he was playing this vibraphone with so much musicality, with so much, you know, uh, sensitivity and everything that, you know, I, I absolutely adored him. And of course, the love continued to grow <laughs> in the years to come. Yeah, and the studios, the, front, the, the Frontera were, 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 you know, really, really cool. We put it up with some, with some students also. But, you know, when you feel with someone from the first moment, that's, that's it. Can Svet slam dunk a basketball? I want to know. Anybody? Of course. Know? He can? He's pretty tall. No. Yeah, he's huge. Oh, I don't know what we did. If we, if we, Maybe we did some football there yeah. in Samobor. I don't remember. So maybe you, that was it. Uh, he can okay. definitely... Yeah. He, I, I don't know about basketball, but the man can drink his body weight in coffee. I don't know that much. In coffee? Yeah. yeah. No, huh. Can he palm a basketball? Yeah. Ah, come on. <laughs> but he was very good with ladies, I can tell you. Very good with late. I feel like, huh? He came totally frozen. Like, <laughs> we're probably gonna have to cut this out, but you should tell us more just you know, behind closed doors. <laughs> no, this is good. No, 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 no. It's probably this, 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 you know, uh, the temperament like we, we really clicked well. But speaking about coffee, that's true that the guy never slept, you know, he slept a little bit on the, on the marimba bags behind the scenes and then he went on practicing and playing yeah i think we even have a have a, have a picture of him somewhere become somewhere in some angle you know on the marimba <laughs> cases <laughs> you know? yeah that's fantastic um, okay, so uh, Ivana, we wanted to ask you a question that uh, came in from one of our other co-hosts who is not here today, um, and she apologized, Carly, Carly Vina. Sorry, I went into full like, Serbian mode. Um, hi, Carly. We know you're busy. You have a lot of gigs, unlike the rest of us on this day. Um, but uh, here is one of her questions. She said, uh, please tell us more about uh, your summer percussion festival. What is the focus, and how has it evolved over the years? So what is nice about this festival is that uh, initially it was uh, in the frame of a, of another festival, Chamber Music Festival. It's not it's not big. The town is not big. It's close to Zagreb. Uh, the venues are not huge, so we don't have like thousands of people. But somehow um, we had a lot of audience, you know, non-percussionist audience and local audience coming to our concerts. And um, the focus initially was loosely on the marimba, uh, but, uh, you know, we always had all percussion. And my, my goal was to always invite um, uh, people that have never been to Croatia, uh, percussionists. Uh, first of all, I would, you know, for because uh, it is a festival, but it is also a seminar, so it has also ped pedagogical, it has two, uh, uh, um, two, two phases. Uh, concerts, master classes, and, and private lessons, and a lot of chamber music. Uh, my idea was always to invite a, a renowned percussionist, a respected and renowned percussionist, uh, a, a rising star, like somebody who is really, you know, now uh, very popular, but is still uh, still young, and just, you know, people that are not known at all, maybe people that just finished, that just graduated, but are, you know, are very interesting. And I still, you know, I never managed to invite all the people that I would want to. I especially lo love to invite people that are probably 
not known at all, but they're just, you know, great musicians. And what I always like to do is like, I learned a lot from Nancy's festivals, trying to, you know, always play together on the festival, trying always to um, come with additional content, like, you know, having Tai Chi or having Irish step or having some, you know, things like this that can be loosely connected with, with, uh, with uh, our, our art but can be interesting, also relaxing a little bit for the students. So what I think is nice uh, that it's a cozy, small, relaxed town where everything is close and that for those, that period, you just really live for being together, making music together. And, and what I, as I, as, as I spoke before, what I am most happy about is that we are not, you know, playing just percussionists for percussionists. We are trying really to, you know, play for a larger, larger, uh, broader audience, and at the same time, of course, have this this intensive uh, uh, pedagogical part with master classes, workshops, a lot of chamber music, uh, and private lessons. Uh, yep. Cool. And what do you have lined up for this upcoming year? So okay, finally, Nebojša is coming, Živković. He has never been to Croatia. Yeah. Really? Wow. Not for. Festival. I mean, he has been, but not for a percussion festival. He taught me and how of to course, your last name. Sorry. He taught me how to say your last name correctly. His. Yeah. Zivkovic. No, your last name. He he told me taught me how to pronounce your last name correctly. Like okay, Bilic, Kuljeric, Bilic. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, he, Casey just said that uh, Zhivkovic taught him how to pronounce your last name, and now you're basically teaching uh, Casey how to pronounce Zhivkovic's oh, okay. last name. So, okay, okay, you know. okay. It, it wasn't Sorry. worth interrupting you, definitely. Okay, so Nebojša. Then uh, um, uh, we will have a, a, a lucid duo with uh, uh, Tomasz Golinski and Irena Manolova. We'll have uh, uh, Walter Mertens. He's a Belgian Belgian guy who play who uh, composes a lot of uh, pieces for uh, for percussion ensemble, maybe for young for younger for younger uh, 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 students. Uh, me myself. Uh, we will have uh, um, some young young percussionists from Croatia playing, but that's that's mostly this this year. We are kind of shorter for one day. A little bit more tight because of the dates and everything. Um, it is actually crazy. I, I mean, I'll speak about it now because um, I don't know how is it in the states, but now you know in Europe with this hysteria with coronavirus and everything, so things are being really, really crazy. I don't know if uh, in, in Slovenia, the bordering country, they actually cancelled all the events. You know, all the gatherings, events and everything. Italy is being closed and everything. So we are trying to, you know, it's everything is fine in Croatia still, but we are kind of trying to deal with all this uh, log logistically and, and uh, organization wise. I don't know how is it going on in, in the States, but in Europe, the hysteria is quite strong. <laughs> I had to come yeah. up with this because it's crazy here. I don't know how much you feel that, but... Yeah, it's, it's, it's starting to get bad here, and there's a lot of bad cancellations. It feels crazy. Yeah, I mean, I just yeah. yeah, every day it's like, yep, confirmed cases here, 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 and here, and here, and yeah, I'm very but aware of how much I'm touching my face. <laughs> Sorry, say again. Samobor is safe, totally. <laughs> Everybody, go to Samobor. <laughs> Samobor will keep you safe. I had a blast there. Your festival was so much fun. Yeah. Hope you had. Hopefully you had. I oh, think we I had. We had. I did, and and um. Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name. He walked me to the the ruins up in the hills, like the, the castle. It was so cool. That's so cool to us. Who was with you? Okay, the, the Santangeli were there. Who was with you that that year? Oh, the other guests. Uh, yeah, definitely Francesca. Um, uh, I don't. I, that's all I remember. It might have just been Francesca, I guess. No, 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 no. There were other people. Um, look, what I look what I still have. Ooh, you can check then inside who was there. Oh, wow. Pana? Yeah. No, this is just I staff think... paper. Actually, oh, just staff... Staff... Okay. 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 Actually, okay, it's guitar okay. tab paper. Okay. Yeah. 
some of our But now we got, we got independent. Now we moved because before it was in autumn. Now it's in summer. We changed the name because we, are, we became independent. We are not with this bigger festival anymore. So there, were, there, were, there will be more uh, open air events, which is cool, you know, like uh, with the, for a larger audience. So, yeah, it's, it's developing nicely. And, yeah, I'm happy. So come to Samovar. <laughs> Everybody go there. to Samovar. I was there in 2015. Yep. Yeah. Wow. It feels longer than that. Oh, no. I guess it's 2020 now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Confusion about past or present, let's decide. Okay. Uh, we are so happy uh, to have you on the show, Ivana. Thank you so much. And we're going to bring you back with your duo because we did not even get to scratch the surface. And the, we had so many questions that we did not get to go through. But that's because the discussion has been so productive and fruitful. So thank you so much for sharing your fabulous thoughts and energy today. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. You're so cool. You are so cool. Such a badass. Um, anyway, thank you all for listening. We'll catch you next time on 223. Bye. Bye, y'all.